In the name of the Holy Trinity, one God. Last June, I was in the UK visiting family, and I went to Durham City in England. I was enjoying a weekend package that a generous parishioner had given me. The weekend included two VIP tickets to a concert in Durham Cathedral, and my sister Jacqueline came with me. Durham is famous for its stunning cathedral and castle that dominate the landscape from the top of a steep hill. We didn't quite leave ourselves enough time for the steep climb up that hill from our hotel to the cathedral, and we reached the west entrance in the back, breathless, with about two minutes to go before the concert was due to begin. Now, Durham Cathedral dwarfs St. Paul's. It's 900 years old. It's huge. It probably seats over 1,500 people. And it was full that night. An usher descended on us with cries of relief. We almost gave your seats away. And she guided us all the way up the central aisle to the front row, to the most prominent seats right on the aisle, next to various distinguished personages. Of course, everyone was watching as we hurried to our seats and tried to become invisible. Now, I'm used to walking up cathedral aisles, but I would have been content with the back row. In Luke's gospel, Jesus is being watched. He is constantly in the public eye, whether he's teaching the crowds or preaching in the synagogue or attending swanky dinner parties. If you read the gospel continuously from chapter 3, where he begins his ministry, to this passage in chapter 14, you can see a pattern emerge. Each time he is among the establishment, whether it's in the synagogue or in the home of a Pharisee, Jesus does something that's guaranteed to infuriate the Jewish authorities. He announces in church that he has got, God has sent him to change the world. He heals on the Sabbath. He allows a strange woman to pour oil on him. He doesn't wash his hands before dinner. He curses his hosts and calls them hypocrites. No wonder we see the Pharisees watching him with more and more hostility. Today's story is the third and final time that Jesus eats at the home of a Pharisee. And there he goes again, criticizing the other guests for competing for the, first, the best seats at dinner. Until quite recently, it wasn't unusual for formal meals to involve etiquette around seating and status. In Jesus' time, the guests arranged themselves on couches around the room with the most important people sitting nearest to the host. In some places, it's still the custom in our day for the most important female guest to be seated to the right of the host, while the most important male guest is seated to the right of the hostess. And to sit in the wrong place is a faux pas. The world still has too many rigid caste and status-related expectations, whether we're aware of them or not. There are plenty of people who wouldn't dream of sitting near the front of a cathedral, because for whatever reason, skin color, economic status, dress code, language, they don't feel entitled. And the people who do feel entitled, with or without good reason, may not even notice that the others are hanging back. So the Pharisees are watching Jesus, and he is watching them. He observes the etiquette, the norm in his culture, and he offers some advice. When you're at a banquet, he says, and he is at a banquet, you'll notice, don't head for the best seats. Seek the most obscure and wait to be invited to move on up. This might sound like common sense advice to avoid public embarrassment, but there's more to it than that. We know that whenever Jesus speaks of banquets and wedding feasts, He's talking about God's table, about the kingdom of heaven, and about the generosity of our God who gathers in the outsiders and gives voice to the voiceless. Do you hear 
the amazing good news here. Jesus is telling us that there is room for everyone at God's table. No matter where you sit, you will be welcomed and fed. You don't have to be someone important or prominent to be cared for. And that's a fundamental theological value for us here at St. Paul's. Jesus is also telling us that we may find ourselves seated next to people we didn't expect. I remember Bishop Jean Robinson of New Hampshire talking about Nigerian Archbishop Peter Akinola, who had led the opposition to Bishop Robinson's ordination and who asserted that Bishop Robinson, along with all LGBT persons, was going to hell. Bishop Robinson commented to the effect that someday Archbishop Peter would be very surprised to find Jean sitting next to him at the heavenly banquet. The church gives us a preview of the kingdom. We come together not because we're friends and not because we have interests in common, but because we are all called onto the same journey. We are all invited by the generous host to join the party. We are all, deserving or undeserving, offered the same mercy and grace. It seems to me that Bishop Jean's theology of grace trumps Archbishop Peter's theology of judgment. My first reaction to this gospel story is to identify with the Pharisees, to assume that Jesus is telling me to be humble. And that's a good lesson for me, and I suspect for many of us who are part of the privileged majority population. Most of us probably aren't too intimidated by the challenge of claiming the best seats. But I wonder about those who have been relegated by our culture to the back rows. I wonder if someone who has experienced racism or homophobia or economic prejudice hears this story and feels empowered by the revelation that God will lift up the lowly and promote those who have been at the back of the line to the VIP seats. This is more than good news. It's a revolutionary pep talk for the poor and the powerless. And it seems to me that this lifting up is something that we who are privileged can do on God's behalf. We can look for the people who hang back in the shadows and offer them the best seats. We can adopt God's preferential care for the marginalized and the oppressed. We can take a step back so that others can take a step forward. And not only can we, but we should because the sin of entitlement, the abuse of power wrought by the people currently occupying the best seats, has brought our world to a point where the oceans are dying of poison, the forests are ablaze, and the climate is becoming ever more extreme. Our demand for convenience, for beef, palm oil, fossil fuels, and other resources have brought our world to the brink of destruction. It's time for those who have exalted themselves to be humbled. It's time to go out and invite the poor and the crippled, the lame and the blind to the party because the ones in the front seats have failed as stewards of God's banquet. At the beginning of our service, we prayed a collect which addresses God as the author and giver of all good things. God gives us life as a free gift to use or abuse as we wish, and the same goes for the world we live in. What if we were to take our cue from our generous God? What if we were to commit ourselves to sharing these precious gifts by limiting our demand for the commodities whose production depletes and damages the planet? What if we were to extend the same privileges and freedoms that we enjoy to all of God's children? without regard for status or identity. Perhaps then we would find ourselves living abundantly, living the way God calls us to live. On this Labor Day weekend, that's something worth working for. Amen.